the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. Come on, if you'd like, stand to your feet. Or you can just remain seated, whatever you want to do. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit, my heart, my life, all of our hearts, all of our lives. For, Father, we haven't come to hear from a man or woman. We haven't come to hear from an old man, young man, short man, tall man, black man, white man. We haven't come to hear from anybody except the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. You're the teacher of the church. Here's our heart. Fill it with your ways, your want, your desire, your passion, so that we can be all that God would have us to be, do all that Jesus made a way for us to do, and and become what the Holy Spirit is empowering us to become. God will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you for blessing all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, There are brothers and our sisters, and at no time do we think of ourselves as better than them. We ask you to bless them, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, as you would bless us. We're all in agreement with a great big shout. We say amen. Amen. Tonight, as we go to this message, Fasting for Life, I I know it's God, because I I just don't look for a message like this. I I don't, it's not where I'm at. I'm I'm looking always for a message of encouragement. Not that this is an encouragement, but I think for all of us, you need to understand some things that are basic and and principles as a Christian. There are some things that God shows us in Scripture that's not necessarily mandatory for your salvation, but it's healthy for your walk and your life with Jesus. One of them is that you should be baptized. And we have water baptisms all the time going around here, but... You know, it's very healthy for you. The other time is that we should have communion from times to time so that we're always reminding ourselves as who he is and what he's done for us so we don't forget about it. The other thing that Christians really are, Old Testament as well as New Testament, you'll see is that uh, God's people are always fasting. Uh, I think it's become a very important issue, but... For some people, not so much for the Christian church. We like to eat too much. You know, we Christians are kind of funny. We don't really get to do anything. You know, we don't meet at the bar. We don't smoke the cigarettes. Well, some of you do still, but most don't. You know, we're not out drinking and cocktailing and things like that. We gather together, we go do something called what? Eating. And we like to eat. And for most of us, it's... uh, it's a fun habit, but it also can be a disgusting habit. I, I think uh, for me personally, I, this is the, maybe the second or maybe even the first most weight I've ever carried in my entire life. I have two pairs of pants. I've got the one I've got on now and a, a light blue pair of jeans that I could get into and still be comfortable and breathe. I'll wear the light jeans this weekend probably to trick you. So you don't, you know, and, uh, and I'm sick and tired of standing in front sucking in the old man belly. I don't know where that came from. I had a pot belly in my life. I now have a pot belly. In fact, I can't shave in front of the mirror after I get out of the shower unless I put my clothes on. It's just too disgusting. And um, so I, I put all my clothes on and then shave, getting my shirts all wet and everything else because I just can't stand looking at this body. It's just falling apart. And I say that because it's all changeable with God. And it's a time to do it. Fasting is not something you do to lose weight. I have to tell you, in fact, there's a real warning numerous times in Scripture that when fasting becomes an issue about you personally in some physical area of your life, God really questions it and really isn't in love with the idea of it. In fact, I think it's uh, Zechariah, the I would guess the seventh chapter, verse number five, where God questions fasting and he actually comes along and says, you think you were fasting for me? And then he comes along and he says, for me? In other words, these people weren't fasting at all for God. Now, it just so happens that if we're going to fast, we're going to lose weight, but you can't just fast to lose weight. You can if you want, go do it. But the question is whether or not the purpose of fasting is a relationship deeper with God. 
not one just to lose weight. Oh, the good thing about it is we're going to lose some weight. And some of us that are in here, not all of you, but some of us need to lose some weight and get life just a little bit more under control. Fasting isn't always fun, but it can be fun. I'll tell you what's less fun is when you try to get into a pair of pants and they don't fit. That's less fun than fasting. There's a lot of things in life you've got to get your priorities made out right. Um, here's what's less fun. Less fun to wake up in the middle of the night because you're bloated and you just don't feel good at all. That's less fun than fasting. You know, there's a whole lot of things that when you, when you don't fast, you'll find yourself, your body picking up all kinds of activities and functions in life that really make you more miserable than if you did fast. So a lot of times we look at fasting and it's really not fun at all. It all depends on what kind of an attitude you have or I have. Are we going to approach this and realize that there's some real benefits if we fast the right way? And it's really important for finding out reasons for fasting. And tonight I want to give you three simple reasons for fasting. Because I think they're really important for all of us. I know this. We could say for your health, oh yes. Losing weight, oh yes. Getting into those, remember those clothes that you used to have? The, you have the skinny, anybody have skinny clothes, medium clothes, fat clothes in the closet? Uh, I, hey, I've got skinny, medium fat and double fat and 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 mama says let's go buy some clothes i'm saying no i'm not gonna buy any more clothes because that just gives me an excuse to keep eating does anybody know what i'm talking about so you end up wearing stuff from your a6 graduation it's like and that i've had that shirt for like ever i saw a picture the other day when we built the building there was a picture of me in a hat i don't know if you remember and deborah looks over at me and she says you still have that same shirt in your closet I don't know what it is with old men, but we kind of like don't want to throw away clothes, you know? But we ought to get to the place where we're out. So there's lots of reasons for fasting, but the best reason is a relationship with God. And that's what I would love to encourage you. This year, 2013, why not make it the best year spiritually you've ever had in your life? Look, look, I already know we all think we're cool with God. After all, we've been told a million times that he loves us. We all think, you know, we can do no wrong. We're doing great. We went to church twice last month. That's got to mean something, you know. And then, uh, you know, I even tithe. Well, it really wasn't a real tithe, but it was close enough to a tithe. Well, it wasn't that close, but it was pretty good compared to what I used to do. And we all make excuses about where we're at with God. So why don't we cut out the excuses here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. Why don't we make a dedication of commitment of our heart to make the year 2013 the greatest spiritual year we have ever had. Now let me tell you something. You can do that simply by believing God. And this is our year we talked about last Sunday night. Believing in two 2013. We're going to change the world we live in by believing. Believing that families are going to get restored. Believing that you're going to get better jobs and raises and bonuses and your $10 is going to spend like 100 and your $100 is going to spend like 1000 Why not believe God for the supernatural? Why not believe God for great, mighty, marvelous things? And why not have an attitude at the beginning of the year that I've got a year ahead of me. I want to dedicate it to God and make it the best year I've ever had spiritually. Don't care about anything else, but spiritually, I want to get closer to God than I've ever gotten in my life. I want to be able to hear his voice. I want to be able to follow his commands. I want to be able to understand his word. I want to see him in everything that I do and everything that I am involved in. I want to see God in a mighty way. Why not make? This is your call. I can't do it. If I could do it, if I could just impart to you the very passions of God that it drops down inside your heart, I would have done it a long time ago. I can't do it. It's all a commitment you make to make this the most spiritual year. You say, well, what about fasting? There's all kinds of different fastings. I want to just in, in, in give you insight on uh, all kinds of it. You can fast for a meal. 
You can fast for a day. You can fast for 40 days, all scriptural. You can be a Daniel fast where you get away from all the tasty delicacies of the king's meat. Or you could go for nuts and grains like, like um, uh, uh, um, yeah, Isaiah and just go for different types of fasts like that. I mean, just to fast for a day, to fast for a, for a, 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 a meal, giving up a certain portion of what, fasting a percentage of the meal. Instead of eating the whole meal, you fast half the meal. Instead, I mean, there's all kinds of ways you have to determine. I can't determine it for you. If you want me to determine what's going to help you, here's what I'm going to say to you. Let's don't eat anything, just drink water for the next 40 days. How many are on board with that one? Now, four of you would, and then you'd drop out. So therefore, guess what? This is really your heart and how much you want God. But first, you got to, before you want God, you got to make commitment for God. I don't make a commitment that says this is going to be the best year spiritually in my life. What can I do to start it off right? And I really believe fasting is a way to start it off because you'll see some great things taking place in the midst of fasting that brings you close to God. And when you're close to God, you get answers to God. You get answers from God. You get answers and open doors and closed doors when you're close to God. And everything and anything you can do to get close to God, you ought to be doing it. Getting into church brings you closer to God. You know, getting into a place of, uh, 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 of, uh, of doing God's word gets you closer to God. Uh, singing songs, having communion at home instead of just having it in church. Uh, getting together, having Bible studies. Even if it's just husband and wife or our friends and friends that get together. If you don't have a wife or a husband, you can get together with friends and talk about Jesus and spend some time on a regular basis, be accountable to each other. There's all kinds of ways you can get closer to God, but I, here's a way that's not often thought of, and it's fasting. So let's talk about it just for a moment. Reasons for fasting, three things that God gave me to give to you. Number one, fasting controls the flesh. And I ought to put in parentheses instead of the flesh controlling us. I don't know if you know this as I know it, but I am always controlled or trying to be controlled by my flesh. My flesh wants to eat everything. My flesh loves food. My flesh loves Rocky Road ice cream. With whipped cream I put on it now, it's disgusting. <laughs> the other day Deborah was on the phone with her mother. She was in the, sitting on the counter. She couldn't talk to me, she was talking to her mother. I scooped out a big bowl of Rocky Road ice cream. You, I look at her laughing over there. And then I got a, one of those things of whipped cream, you know. And I'm telling you the truth. I piled it at least a foot high and I walked out. <laughs> she was, see, my flesh. I'm, I'm saying I'm going to tease Deborah, but do you know I ate every bit of it? <laughs> Controlling the flesh helps you to get away from the things that are physical and gets into the things that are spiritual. And every now and then, the flesh has to be dealt with. It wants to rise up and take you to the wrong place. It wants your eyes to be set on something you shouldn't be looking at. The flesh will make you and cause you to do things you shouldn't want to do that'll help hurt you in every area of your life. And you need to, and so do I, be a people that realize that every now and then the disciplines of the flesh have got to be taken or the flesh will overrun you. It won't be very long before you're so unhealthy that you never get to live out the life that God wanted you to live out. What could you have done if you were healthy and strong and young and vigorous and, and full of vivation and life? What could you accomplish? Fasting brings you to the life of God and takes the flesh out of it. And I just want to share it with you. Paul writes, and Paul, if you remember, is the apostle who writes two-thirds of the New Testament. You'll find fasting all through the New Testament. Paul and his buddy Barnabas were great fasters. And you'll find that Paul makes a statement in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. In the last verse of the ninth chapter, verse number 27, let me put it up on the overhead for you. He makes this statement. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. If I don't discipline my body, what next size pants am I going to be buying? It won't be very long before I'm taking car covers off the cars and making pants out of them for me. 
There is only one direction, and it's big, if I let the flesh continue to go. In that bigness of letting the flesh, I'm tired, I can't do what God wants me to do, I don't feel good, my flesh has now got me in bondage, I hardly get out of bed, when I get some time off, instead of producing something, I'm laying around like a big beached whale, all of a sudden, somebody ought to give me an amen, I'm not the only beached whale in here. And so what we do is we need to discipline our bodies. At least that we have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. And we become disqualified because we fail to discipline our flesh. One of the great ways of disciplining your flesh is telling it to shut up. You're not going to do what it wants you to do. Like for an example, here, here's, here's a, a telling to shut up. You get up in the morning, you've worked all week long, you just had a six day week, and you know church is on Sunday, and you say to yourself, I am not going to church, I'm tired, I deserve it. You know where that came from? It came strictly from your flesh side. And you bought into it, therefore you missed the very spirit of God. You know the people that got healed tonight, what if they decided to stay home? What if they decided to stay home? They could go the rest of the year being sick. What if they decided to stay home tonight? God touched their lives. How about so many times in areas where we miss and we become disqualified because we have not told our flesh just to simply shut up. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And one of these areas, man, I, I, I love sweets. Does anybody like sweets besides me? Could you raise your hand if you like sweets? Okay, so you could fast everything. Like I used to want to, when I was a young boy, I would want to fast sardines because I hate sardines. <laughs> but I, I, I just tell you, that's not what I need to do. I need to fast that which I really like that tells my flesh to shut up. And it's very important for us to see. The second thing, reasons for fasting is a change in your spiritual walk. And this is so important for us, guys, because if we don't change our spiritual walk, and our walk has got to be a walk that gets us closer to God all the time. Changing our spiritual walk. Did you know that your spiritual walk will never improve until you do something about it? Let me say it again. A lot of people don't understand this. Your spiritual walk will never improve until you... Do something about it. One more time. Your spiritual walk, that means living out life, to walk out life, to live out life, will never improve until you do something about it. I was with Dr. Kanga the other day, and he made a statement to me, and it was a brilliant statement. He said, there's never a time, raise your hand, everybody, right here, raise your hand. If you got your insurance card, just give it to him. He's going to get it anyway. Anyway, uh, so, uh, so Dr. Kanga made this statement to me. He said these, these words. He says, I've never been in church when God didn't speak to me. The pastors are so anointed. They're so wonderful. They're so great. I mean, they're so in tune with God. And I stopped and I said, Dr. Kanga, let me, let me tell you how it is. It's not the pastor's. It's the attitude of your heart. You come in expecting to hear from God. You come in wanting God. You don't make an excuse. You don't have to go to church. You want to go to church. And you come with a passion. And can I tell you something? You will never stay and change spiritually in your walk with God until you make the choices to make some changes in your life. And that's what takes it different. It had nothing to do with how good the pastors are. Sure, pastors got to be committed, can't just do nothing. But guess at the same time, it has to do with that man's heart. He's got this heart that says, I've just got to have more of God all the time. My goodness sakes, a lot of this. Wonderful. In Psalms 35, David writes these words. Psalms 35, you got your Bible, verse number 13. Psalms 35, verse number 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting. Now watch this. I humbled myself. When there was a problem is what he's saying. When there was pressure against me. When there are things that aren't going well. You've got to change it, guys. 
There's no, I always say it like this, there's no magic wand that I can wave over your head and everything will be perfect. There's no Tinkerbell going to land on you and everything is going to be sprinkled with fairy dust. There's a job you have to do. There's a job God has to do. And what you both do is you get in and get the job done. And your job is to say, where I'm at today is not good enough for where I need to be tomorrow. Now watch this. He says, I've got, they're all sick. They're, they're, the clothing, sackcloth, things are bad things. I humbled myself with fasting. But listen to what happens. Here's, watch this. And my prayers would, and my prayer would return to my own heart. I humble myself with fasting and my prayer returned to my own heart. In other words, my prayer, let me tell you something. Here's this powerful statement. I humble myself with fasting and I read it like this. Now my prayers return to me. In other words, my prayers are being there. They're responsive. Return to my own heart. Uh, you can say it and read about it any other way you want to. You could say, oh, he's just complaining. Nothing ever happened in his life. But here he is humbling himself and fasting. And it did it change his life? Did he not become the greatest leader Israel has ever known? Listen, did he not become one of the richest men on the planet? Did he not become one of the greatest? Is he not the one that's mentioned in the Bible as a heart after God's own? It may not happen at that very moment. It may seem like his prayers return to him, but can I just read it to you like this? Sometimes I really need prayer with passion to come back to me. And it's in the humbling of my heart that brings my prayers back with God. It changes my relationship with God. That's what fasting does. And you know what the outcome is? Blessings down the road. Proof of that is in the Bible. So here we find out two things right off the bat about uh, wonderful reasons for fasting. One, controlling your flesh. Second is changing your spiritual walk. And until you change it, it'll never change. Let me just say it again. Until you change it, it will never change. God's not going to make you do anything. I love the people who pray, say, oh God, make me be a tither. Make me love you more. Make me be a good person. Make me, please don't pray that prayer. It's the worst prayer you could ever pray. If God has to make you do something, how he makes you do it, you don't want to know. <laughs> Terrible, just do it. Just learn how to do it. We're talking about reasons for fasting. Last one for tonight. Reasons for fasting. Invoking his help. I used to think fasting, if it was too personal, it uh, took the purpose out of fasting, which was relationship with God. But I'm thoroughly convinced in studying scripture that fasting invokes his help, brings you back to a personal and deep, meaningful relationship with God. I don't know about you, but I need to have a personal, deep, meaningful relationship with God. I don't know about you, but I need his help. If I'm even going to fast beyond an hour, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Has anybody fasted and all of a sudden the refrigerator had a voice? <laughs> what is that all about? You open up the refrigerator to see what demon's in there. How about this one? Has anybody fasted and then you open the refrigerator it happens to be full of food and you don't want to waste the food? So you say to yourself, well, I got all this food. I, I, I'm going to, you know, I'll start next week. Anybody ever been there? Let me tell you how fast it is. Throw it all out. Get it over with. Bring it in here. The, the staff that cleans the church, our cleaning crew, will eat anything, believe me. We have to fight them to get them out of the refrigerator. They eat our lunches. Just bring it all in here. We'll eat it all. But an amazing part about this, and so important for us, is that I need his help, and so do you. David again writes, and I love this, this cool little thing. I need his help. Watch this. He's down. He's out. He's, but there's something inside of David. Psalm 69, you've already been in Psalms 35, 13. Psalm 69, verses 9. Let me just, let me, I want to read this to you in such a way that you understand it a little better and clear. In Psalms um, 69. And when you get there, look at verse 9. David's writing, he says, 
because zeal for your house has eaten me up. That ought to be something for all of us. Do you have a zeal for the house of God like that? See, my friend Dr. Kanga does. There's a zeal for the house of God. Zeal, man, can't keep me out. Got to have it. It's part of my life. He says, because zeal for the house of God has eaten me up. And then he comes along and he makes these statements. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and I chastened my soul with fasting that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth my garment. I became uh, a byword to them. In other words, here's all these bad people speaking bad against God. They're now speaking bad against David. Those who sit in the gate speak against me. I am the song of the drunkards. But as for me and my prayer is to you, O Lord, in this acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me. In the truth of your salvation, deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the flood waters overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up. Let not the pit shut its mouth on me. And the reason he's saying all that to God, he is feeling God because he's been in a time of fasting. When you feel God. And that's what fasting does. It changes your life. And then whatever needs you have, you can present them to God. Tonight, three things, simple things. And I love this. Controlling the flesh. Changing your spiritual walk. Invoking his help. You'll feel it. And you'll know he's there in a time of pressure. Man, there's nothing better than to know such a thing. When you fast, you're in pretty good company. Did you know that? People that have fasted before you with God, same God, Moses, the nation of Israel, Elijah, not the piano player, (laughs) Ezra, Daniel, Paul, Barnabas, all the leaders of the church fasted on a regular basis. Even Jesus, Luke 4th chapter. I'm not going to go there with you, but he hadn't eaten anything for 40 days. I'm not saying you need to have a 40-day fast. You do what God tells you to do. Whether it's for one meal or one day or 40 days, that's between you and God. But do it with a heart that says you want to control your flesh instead of letting your flesh control you. Do it with a heart that says, I want to walk better, deeper spiritually. Do it with a heart that says, I now can feel God, I now can feel God, and I can call upon him for help in every area of my life. Fasting will bring you to that place. It's something we ought to do on a regular basis. Is it fun? Make it fun. It's a whole lot more fun than punching another hole in your belt. (laughs) Come on, somebody. It's a whole lot more fun than letting your flesh tell you to do things you shouldn't be doing or have a relationship with God that's based on carnality instead of a spiritual walk. Or not being able to feel comfortable with your relationship with God so you can't call upon him in a time of help. Today, it's your call. If God spoke to you today, come on, give him a great big praise the Lord. I just want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. So let me have a few moments. I know most of you that are in here hear this every week at every service. 
I one time asked God, I said, God, could you change this part? Because it's hard on the people. God said, why are you changing something that's good and works? The people that are wise will handle it. And I think you are. So for those of you that are here, let me just challenge you for a moment. You know, the Bible says that you should check yourself out from time to time, make sure you're okay with God. So let's check yourself out right now. Nobody will know but you and God, but be honest with yourself to see whether or not you're right with God. I'm going to ask you a question. Nobody will know the answer but you and God, but answer it truthfully in your heart. Don't just stare at me. Answer it truthfully in your heart. If you were to walk out of this building and your heart stopped and you died, bang! Would you go to heaven? Or would you go to hell? That's the question. Now you answer that question, most people would answer the question like this, which tells us where they're really at. I think I'm going to go to heaven. But guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven like whoever's the most positive thinker gets to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you. Some of you answered and said, well, I hope I'm going to make it, Pastor Jim. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can hope your way into heaven. You're not going to make it. Some of you might have said to yourself, well, I, I'm a really good person. You know, I'm pretty good. I guess I'm going to go to heaven because I'm good. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good. Nowhere. It's not in the Bible at all. You got that kind of thinking from Hollywood movies, and they have no concept of how to get to heaven in Hollywood. Some of you might have said to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, I love God a whole lot. I, I just really love the Lord. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you love God. Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it if you think that's going to get you to heaven. Now, well, listen to this. Jesus says these words. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. You know what he just said? You cannot go to heaven your way, my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven God's way. And you talk to people nowadays, they all have an idea about how they're going to get to heaven. Can I tell you, that's why Jesus said, there's no other way but his way. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Words of Jesus. You can't get there any other way. Then he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. He doesn't leave it up to you. doesn't leave it up to me. We think he does, but he doesn't. He tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the scripture. He says these words, you must be born again. Am I doing something weird? You must be born again, John 3rd chapter. And the word of God is so clear. When I say the word born again, everybody turns off most people in American churches because they've been taught that born again people are idiots and radicals and fanatics and goofballs. But that's not what born again means. Let me explain what born again means to you so you'll understand from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Is that okay? Here's what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible. Here's the proof. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. And he says these words. I'm coming again. And you know he is. You just don't know when, neither do I. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what Jesus just really said? He really said people who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're not going to make it. They're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Now let me define for you so there's no misunderstanding what lukewarm is. Lukewarm, a little in, a little out. Lukewarm, a little up, a little down. Lukewarm, a token prayer, occasional church attendance. Watch this. Watch this. You're not against God. Oh, no. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. And that's the dividing line right there. That's the line in the sand. 
You're not wholehearted for God. You're not against him, but you're not wholehearted for him. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. Lukewarm. And you're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Wow, how crude, how rude is that? But somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. And I'm here tonight telling you the truth because I love you and respect you and honor you. The only way that you're going to get right with God is to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Be born again, headed for heaven, and deny your presence in hell. Now listen closely. I already know, and so does God, that you know who Jesus is. You just got through celebrating Christmas. You heard about the baby in the manger. You sung the songs. Every year of your life, you've heard about Jesus. You know about Easter and resurrection. Oh, come on, you know who Jesus is. But that will not get you to heaven. Are you listening to me? Don't let anything disturb you right now. It will not get you to heaven because you have head knowledge about who Jesus is. Even the devil knows who Jesus is and he's not going to heaven. It's not about what you have in your head. I already know you have Jesus there. It's about what you have in your heart and have you given him all of your heart and given him all of your life. You know why you gotta give it to him? Listen to this, because he's not a thief. It's your heart and your life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it, a manipulator to make you do this. He's not gonna hit you in the head with a two by four and you know, cause your life to be so miserable you gotta run to him. He could have made robots by the billions that look exactly like you, but he didn't. He gave you a free will choice, and here's the choice. Will you choose to give God all of your heart and all of your life and make Jesus your Lord and Savior of your life, or won't you? And that's what life is all about. And tonight, here you are in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed, we've clapped, we've sung. You saw the miracles of God right before your eyes. Whether you believed it or not, man, you're going to have to start by getting right with God before you start believing anything about God. And you're going to have to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. And that's what your job is tonight because this is your day of salvation. God brought you here, a divine appointment with him. You've had a lot of appointments, plumbers and attorneys and painters and everybody else, doctors, but a divine appointment you have tonight, one with God. You give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. That's why you're in here. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do it? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. I'm going to count to three in a moment. Pop my hands together. Bang, you're going to hear this sound. It'll sound like this. One, two, three. I'll go, bang. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Wow, I'll see your hand go up. But tonight you can get right with God. Tonight is your night. Start off the year the right way. Instead of running from God or checking him out a little here and there, give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. He's a faithful God. He'll meet you there. Come on, tonight is your night. I'm counting to three. Here it is, your call. Sit there and do nothing. But then Jesus will do nothing. Because he said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. He said, but if you deny me, I'll deny you. Sit there and do nothing is your way of saying I deny him. Tonight, all across this auditorium. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Three, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, thank you, there's two, thank you. Back here, there's three, there's four, thank you. God bless you, there's five, thank you. There's six, thank you, there's seven, thank you. There's eight, God bless you. There's eight wise people already in his house. Anybody else, there's eight, I know there's more than eight of you in there. Come on, anybody else, there's nine. God bless you, going for God. Anybody else, anybody else, anybody else, anybody else? There's nine, where are you? 10, you're saying to yourself, I wonder if I should, you should. Where are you? There's nine wise people. Where are you, 10? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for nine wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All nine of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Get out of your seat. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. All, nobody leaves during this period of time. It's really rude. 
to try to get people to come forward. You're going that way. They're just going to follow you right on out instead of coming forward. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. All of you that raised your hand, you come right now. Come, 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 come. Lord, I give you my heart. I give my soul. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You raise your hand. You're serious about God. Get up here. Every breath that I take. Come on, you can come too, even if you didn't raise your hand. Just come anyway. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I'll live for you. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Praise God. All of you in front, thank God you have come. We're excited. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing, okay? And I want you just to look over to your left. This is Pastor Joel. Joel is a really good guy, like Noel Joel. And so easy to, I just gave you something to remember. So Joel's a good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to do three things. One, he's going to pray with you. You need to invite Jesus in your heart. Two, he's going to tell you about a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers, something that will help you get strong in Jesus. Is that okay? So you don't go back and fall through the cracks and wonder what happened to God in your life. We want to help you get strong so you can help other people get strong. Let us help you do that. If you'll make a commitment to this church for, for a period of time and meet with a spiritual personal trainer, I think it's four or five weeks, you're going to just love it right before church. They'll buy you coffee, tea, nachos. He'll explain all that to you. Third, he's going to give you some free information, literature. Take it home, read about what to do next. Now that you've made this commitment, what does God want from you now that you're a Christian? What does God want from you? That literature is like third grade reading level. You'll love it. It's easy. You can read it in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and it's so simple. And then follow what it says. It's real, real easy. It's called Welcome to Your Destiny, and you're going to love it. It only takes a few moments. The people you came with, they'll wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over this way. Come on, everybody, give the Lord a great big praise. Aren't you glad you came to church?